Records. Again, my name is David Reed. I'm, I'm uh, director for what we, we call our Advanced Microgrid Competency Center here at Schneider Electric. Uh, and I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and talk about a specific project. So we're talking about today about resiliency, uh, but resiliency covers quite a bit, transportation, waste, water, uh, communications. But I'm going to focus primarily in the energy and the power sector. I'm going to talk to you about a specific client that, that, that we have, Montgomery County because I think it brings uh, together a lot of everything that we're talking about today, uh, you know, about uh, driving uh, focus uh, for resiliency for, for, for the client, providing the, 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 uh, the, the solution. And, and I'm gonna uh, be able to explain to you exactly what their very specific goals and objectives were, uh, but uh, also uh, take a little bit of a deeper dive into what some of the challenges were that, that you know, that, that they had, uh, the overall solution, and how it benefited them. So, just take one step back. For those of you that don't know Schneider Electric, uh, you may be uh, impressed to know that we just moved our U.S. corporate headquarters to Andover, Mass. We, we actually call that Boston One now. So uh, we're, we're a uh, French-based corporation with, with, our global cor uh, with our global headquarters in, in Paris, France. Our, our, our CEO actually sits in Hong Kong because he likes to have the pulse of, 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 of the client. But we're, we're about 170,000 employees globally. Uh, about $35 billion in overall general revenue, I think 140 some odd manufacturing facilities throughout the globe, but we're pretty much split up 35, 35 and 30 or so between North America, uh, Asia Pac and uh, Europe. Yes, sir. No, no, to, to, to Andover Mass, I'm sorry, to, to, to Andover Mass, but, but we call it Boston One, so. Uh, and, and, and also that, uh, that new facility is uh, one of our f uh, new global, uh, five new global R&D centers that we've created, again, through, through, throughout the globe. That's our North American R R uh, uh, Research and, and Development Center. We, we spend about just, just a little bit uh, over 2% of our annual revenues on, on research and development. And uh, quite a bit of what we are and, 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 and what we do actually happens in that facility. And I think it's projected we'll have something like 10,000 visitors to that facility uh, uh, per year. So uh, that facility is open up. Uh, just contact me or, or I can put you in touch with the right people to be able to take you through and, and, and see our side of the world, how it, how it relates to resiliency in, uh, in that aspect. So, so, so again, let me take a deep dive here. Let me think I'm going forward. That's the, there you go. So again, just, just a specific opportunity o uh, overview. This is uh, for, for uh, Montgomery County. Those of you that don't know uh, Montgomery County, let me just breeze into here a little bit, is, uh, is uh, the largest county in uh, Maryland, uh, approximately uh, about one million people. It's a very high tech, very knowledge based economy. They have roughly 400 facilities, nine million square feet of, of, of owned, uh, real estate for that particular county, about 9,000 employees. But they're the leader and a very progressive uh, utility, uh, a very progressive client. I was just speaking to Wayne, that that's really where most of our focus today is, is on those more progressive uh, clients, whether it's commercial, industrial, f federal, you know, those types of clients are really looking to, to, to step out there. The land lease opportunity that we talk, I would certainly say that's a very progressive and unique solution. But this particular client has ha, uh, currently has about 11 megawatts of solar across 18 sites. They're also one of the largest green power purchasers in the US uh, with last year purchasing over 430 million kilowatt hours of cl clean energy. They, they, they today, they, they procure 100% clean energy for, uh, for all of the count county facilities, not, not so much at their own facility, but through a, a virtual PPA. They're an inaugural partner of the USDOE's combined heat and power, and that's really what drove the microgrid that I'll get into here in a minute. And they were one of the first sites to have a combined, a combined heat and power system installed at their facility. So, so let me just go backwards here a little bit, if I can. Sorry. So let me talk specifically about what a microgrid is, right? This is the DOE explanation of what is a microgrid. And so just if you can understand again, you know, for your clients, again, whether they're a municipality or a corporate client or a federal client, uh, we think there's an opportunity probably for a microgrid in whatever their energy and power planning process is today. So they have some type of a, of, of a master energy plan or maybe you're helping them out with a master energy plan and, they, and a lot of your clients are looking to purchase solar today. They may be looking to add solar and also battery storage into that opportunity. So our objective is that, is that with a microgrid is you wanna look at what their, their current energy mix is and what the future energy mix is based upon the type of facilities that they have, what 
type of production that they have. And so you need to look at, at and combine all of those individual energy systems that are at that physical plant, again, whether it's wind, solar, CHP, you know, uh, incoming uh, from the utility and look at those as individual systems, but a microgrid will then integrate all of those into one existing system and, and, and also combine the interconnected loads and develop a distributed energy resource plan for that client. So the objective is to move the distributed energy resource needs closer to the end use uh, consumption that's gonna happen at that client's facility. And then once that uh, uh, integrated resource is developed, then you wanna integrate, uh, then you wanna be able to control that as a single entity. And why do you control it as a single entity? Because you want it to be parallel with the existing electric utility grid, but also be able to be able to operate in island mode. So we just talked about Len Lease's uh, facility. So the, the objective there would be to build a microgrid so that if there was a critical event, some, cat some catastrophic event, then we would be able to power that site, not only using what Ever the uh, existing energy resources are that they have at the plant, but maybe there's an opportunity now to add in new distributed e energy resources as well. So, okay, yes, sir. Dave, when you talk about the renewable solar, are, are you are those typically utility provided, or is this is stuff that exists kind of right right on site? Yes, yes, and yes. So, so today, I mean, your clients are looking at buying uh, solar uh, from a developer that may. Uh, just want to just sell that client the actual solar system, but then you've got other clients that are looking at, at, at parking that solar system on their facility and having a third party own that asset and then operate that asset for whatever the 20 year period of time. It, and it could be procured in a form of what we call a PPA, a power purchase agreement, or some other type of contracting model. But yeah, so the objective is understand what the client's energy plan is for the next period, Five, 10, 15, 20 years, how it interrelates with their resiliency you know, plan here going forward, and is there an opportunity now to add new distributed energy resources that are more cost effective, that are closer to the load source, that are less pollutant, to, and, and, and then to be able to capture that as, as a microgrid and, and to be able to utilize that as an asset during those critical peak periods of time. Does that make sense? So kind of a confusing, complex, uh, uh, description, but I think that the uh, the overview that we'll show you will probably take you through it. So, one last point is it's not just about obviously energy costs. It's about energy costs. It's about the ability to build that microgrid for for cost reduction, right? To to maximize the energy efficiency. It's about uh, building that microgrid for energy sh energy surety, where now you have a microgrid that you have a defined and maybe a a a, uh, a uh, a precise uh, cost of energy for, for the next 25 years. Uh, it's also about re, uh, sustainability, you know, meeting that, that client's overall uh, corporate sustainability goals, but then most importantly, it is about resiliency, right? So, so we're gonna develop an energy power solution, a microgrid solution for that client to meet those, those existing resiliency needs. So, so um, uh, Montgomery County is a, is a uh, you know, county governance, but uh, it doesn't matter the type of a client or the type of facility, again, whether it's federal, commercial, industrial, municipal, or, or whatever, they have a hot <coughs> button somewhere in this box, and that's what's driving uh, their needs for a microgrid in that space. So, so, uh, um, so you know, this is the dilemma, you know, right? Th this is usually what starts the discussion. It's, it's, it's either something to happen in Storm Sandy or maybe, again, they are a more progressive, you know, client that's looking out towards the future. They have a, a, a need and a desire to develop some type of resiliency plan and power and energy resiliency is obviously a big part of that. So, so what was unique about this client and what was so incredibly uh, helpful with this client is they had some very, very clear objectives going into this opportunity at the very beginning process. Uh, I might add this was also a uh, competitive bid process that we had to go through. So they went through an, uh, a, an RDI that they called, uh, then they went to an RFI stage, and they went to an RFP stage to whittle down the actual competitors throughout the entire process. But their objectives were number one, improve resiliency of county operations. So they can improve resiliency of 100% uh, of all of the county operations. So the first thing that they did was they prioritized their facilities and they developed a resiliency plan for all of those facilities. And the outcome of that was their two top facilities 
ended up with, with some desire or, or some very uh, critical needs, and that was their EOC center and a prison, okay? So, uh, so, uh, so, so they had to improve the resiliency of all the county operations, but that, that uh, process clearly helped them define where they had their, uh, their gaps in looking at all of those 400 plus uh, facilities. Uh, uh, big objective was to upgrade their existing aging electrical distribution infrastructure. They had some medium voltage uh, switch gear in both of those locations and uh, uh, medium and low voltage that, that were back to the 1960s. This is a county governance process. You know, the, the actual operations and maintenance on, uh, on those types of, of devices and that equipment in the physical plant usually gets left out somewhere. So you got 60 year old equipment that you had to deal with even before you get to the design of the microgrid. And they wanted to have the ability to island operations for seven days without grid support. So again, very clear objective. And it's very nice to be able to have a client that has that type of, you know, uh, very precise objective because it helps you model the solution for the client going forward. They also had to, uh, not had, but they had a, a, a very deep desire to mitigate risk of escalating energy price over, over 15 years. They had a, a, an, an objective, it, 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 it wasn't the primary objective, but they had an objective to upgrade infrastructure without having to appropriate capital funds for that particular project, and we'll get into that in just a minute. They had a very uh, deep desire to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They, uh, this, this county has some sustainability goals that were just, again, very clear and concise, and it helped drive the whole process. And then most importantly, once they hit their key target facilities that really needed a resilient opportunity uh, to be developed to, to, to fulfill their power needs, then we wanted to be able to replicate models going down into the other facilities as we move forward. So. <clears throat> so um, the, the challenges, number one, capital procurement was not an option. Uh, it is an option, but we knew that, uh, that because they could never define, uh, someone said, I was, I'm not sure if it was Jamie or someone, one of the earliest speakers, they, they couldn't define what was that downtime cost, believe it or not. I mean, even a prison, you would think that a prison could, could actually define that value, but they couldn't. So, so because they couldn't, or maybe it's just because of the process, the procurement process that they had, in the county, they could never appropriate the necessary funds for the actual opportunity. Uh, some aspects of the solution, you know, uh, had uh, uh, could be tied to a volumetric charge, so that's in in the way that they pay for their energy today. But others couldn't. It had to go through a competitive bid process. Uh, they actually looked at this earlier on, uh, almost two years earlier, through a different process where they were just looking to secure a a uh, sole source with, with another entity and, and they couldn't get that approved either. Uh, you had multiple sites, you had multiple different types of distributed energy resources. Um, uh, the required assets had varying economic useful lives, right? So at one facility, you have uh, a 20 year useful life of this type of application versus at another facility, you only have a five year useful life. So how do you value the economic you know, perspective of that type of project? At the time, rebates and incentives were in constant flux. The federal ITC, the, uh, the investment tax credit, which I'm not sure if most of you are aware, was either going in or out. We had change in, in uh, White House. We didn't know, you know what the future was of those types of opportunities. Uh, so the project scope, getting a little bit down further details. So think of it, you, 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 have, you have a microgrid uh, for the county campus, but at sitting at two different locations. So it's one microgrid, believe it or not, even though we're at two specific locations that I think they're about a, a uh, 22 mile difference between, uh, between the public safety headquarters and the, and the actual prison out in, out in Boyds, Maryland. But, uh, so, so, uh, so when we think of microgrids, we think of what we call anchor resources and other distributed energy projects. So the anchor resource in both locations was a CHP system, a combined heat and power. So think of it as a natural gas fired generation system that is, that is, that is actually uh, meant to actually generate heat and hot water, but also there's a turbine that also generates uh, electricity. And so that's where we come up with the term combined heat and power system. Is that on, on site? No, so, so everything that you see here was new. Uh, you know, uh, also- It's on the campus. Yes, 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 absolutely. So, so, so there's, there's, two, there's two technical solutions at or there's one technical solution at each individual location controlled by one, one microgrid. So we have an 800 uh, kW CHP. So, so that CHP is making heat, it's making hot water, and it's making power for that particular site. It's a continuous run, continuous duty 
uh, plant. Um, and uh, we also had to remove two existing uh, Caterpillar one megawatt uh, diesel gen sets because uh, uh, both of them were past their useful life. And then we also added uh, two megawatts of AC solar. It was both canopy and rooftop. And then at this location, we had to reconfigure the incoming uh, medium voltage and low voltage electrical service coming in from the utility. And we split it up and put in a primary feed and a secondary feed. At the second location, pretty much the same type of technology, just a little bit smaller in size because we didn't have the need for all of the uh, heat and the hot water at the correctional facilities that we did at the public safety headquarters. So think about it, two uh, large mechanical distributed generation systems that are, uh, that are very clean, very environmentally friendly uh, at each of the individual locations. So, so give you an idea or a concept of technically what was installed. Um, what's unique, and this is really what makes this project, I think, incredibly attractive uh, and, 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 and has uh, spent a whole lot, this presentation was actually done for a GTM uh, advisory uh, going into the utility industry to be able to demonstrate to the utilities how we can develop these types of projects. Uh, but what was really unique was the procurement method. This is what we call microgrid or energy as a service procurement method. So think of those two big, very complex uh, electrical and mechanical systems, a lot of capital X, uh, a, a lot of uh, monetized, uh, you know, uh, uh, capex that went into the individual projects, uh, but they were developed and uh, by this team. Uh, but the asset, think of the asset. The asset is owned by today by a third party. So Montgomery County is the benefit of this microgrid as a service, but the asset is owned in this case by Duke Energy Renewables. So a little bit of a busy slide, let me just take you through it here very quickly. So the, the owner of the asset, again, is, is not Montgomery County. The owner of the asset is Duke Energy. And Duke Energy has formed a, or in, in this case it was a PPA, it could be different types of financial procurement vehicles, but Duke Energy and, and Montgomery County now have a contract where Duke Energy will deliver that that microgrid or energy as a service, you know, CapEx to that client and the services that goes with it for the next 25 years. So there's an owner and there's a host now. So Mike, so we used to, we used to think Montgomery County was, was the owner. Well, they're not. Montgomery County is, is the host, host facility. Then you've got multiple different partners. Schneider Electric drove the entire project for the full EPC, engineer, procure, and construct. Uh, but then we had individual partners that were involved with the actual project as well. And then all the way over to the right, so the value prop for the host client is, uh, is, is this entire CapEx is actually uh, developed, constructed, engineered, and then maintained over the useful life of this asset with no upfront capital required from the host client. All the, infra all the infrastructure improvements were also capitalized on that, that, that low to medium voltage switch gear that the county could never uh, actually find the funds to produce. That was actually $4 million. So the $4 million CapEx that they would never do got rolled into the actual project cost, as well as other you know, uh, costs. The client today has more predictable energy costs. They actually have a flat rate, a flat energy rate now going out for the next 25 years. Much, much more higher reliability. Uh, there has to be guaranteed uptime uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and an annual uh, measurement process to be able to ensure that their cost of energy will be less than what the local LDC or the local uh, electric company would be providing for them. Better sustainability, and all of that is developed through what we call a private uh, a public partnership, so a 3P business model. Any, any, any questions here? That's kind of a busy slide, but yes, sir. So how, how does the payment work for the heat, hot water, and cold water? So during the, the design phase and, and the negotiation, we have to go through different levels of engineering. So the first level is, is a conceptual phase. So we think we can, we can generate energy on site with all of these energy resources, all these individual energy resources at X amount of dollars per kilowatt hour for that client. And then you add in what your operations maintenance cost is, right? So this is gonna consume natural gas. It's gonna have to be, uh, you know, items will have to be repaired and replaced over the next 25 years. That is the OPEX that goes into the business model. And that, then out of that, there's a return for the asset owner. There's insurance requirements and everything else. All that goes into the actual, you know, performed model over the, over the 2025. Actually, Ohio State just uh, secured a 50-year 
uh, PPA model to do exactly the same thing. So all the all the capex and all the opex costs go into the model. It's it's extended out, and that's where you start your physical negotiation with the client. Is it a flat rate or does it adjust over the twenty five years? Yes and yes. Th this is uh, this is a uh, this is a flat rate out to I think it's I think it's out to the twelfth year, I believe it is, and then the twelfth year there there is some certain escalation, but. That's really what the client, you know, uh, wanted to do, and their negotiation on, on their side won that part of the deal. Does that make sense? Yeah. So just to be clear, so you know, obviously, by the electricity through the purchase power agreement, but the actual energy and hot and chilled water, as well, is built into that. Absolutely, thing. absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's there's uh, there's constructability guarantees that you have to deliver X, you know. X, uh, X amount of kilowatt hours and X amount of BTUs of thermal, you know, at a certain range and so on. Uh, so the benefits to, to MoCo, uh, this is, again, this is a little bit of older side. It says produce almost that. You can cross out almost. We are now producing, because we're in the second phase now, we, we, we are now producing all energy needed for the site. For, this, for these first two sites, about 3.6 million kilowatt hours uh, annually. Uh, we've achieved their sustainability goals by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we, we, we allowed them to, again, to avoid that $4 million CapEx uh, project that was sitting on the horizon that they could never appropriate the funds for. Uh, locked in known energy price for 25 years. Also, um, again, I'm not sure how many of your clients are, are trying to go through uh, interconnect uh, processes by adding these new distributed energy resources into their site, right? So. So if you're adding a solar panel, if it's a certain uh, size of solar system, you have to go through an interconnect process with the utility. And there's a whole lot of engineering that has to be done. And you really don't know if, if uh, what the outcome of that is until you get the original, pri what they call the primary report for the inter interconnect. We have a client down in New Jersey that was adding uh, only 250 kW of solar, and it was also going to be a battery storage that would be added to it as part of their microgrid in uh, New Jersey, and uh, six months later, we got the interconnect report, and the utility says, sure, looks great, go build your solar plant, but uh, someone's got to come up with a $1.2 million investment to, to, our, to our grid that has to happen first before we'll allow you to, have to, to bring that on. So again, one big benefit, it's a little, little difficult to comprehend and, and really show and, and uh, uh, define what the actual value is, but we're doing that interconnect in the net metering process by looking at this from a more holistic you know, uh, a process up front as well. And then bottom line is we delivered $1.3 million in, in, uh, in state grants for this particular client. So, so, so we achieved uh, the overall objectives for the clients and now, like I said, we're in phase two of uh, picking up some additional uh, facilities at that, at that campus. So that's it for us. Any questions? Yeah. In that area, um, outside of the microgrid, separate from the microgrid, is power generation and transmission two different entities? Or yes. They, yep. It is. Yep. So. Well, no, uh, uh, yes. By uh, you know, it's all it's all part of. I can't remember what the ISO is, but it's all part of that ISO grid. Uh, there are some utilities, uh, the smaller munis, that don't have to participate in any type of transmission overall program. But yes. does the municipality own and manage the group, the distribution? Yes. Or is, the, yeah. is Duke the overall energy <coughs> power provider no. for that area? No. Um, is no th th this is, uh, so one is Exelon, or it's uh, Pepco, which is now right. owned by Exelon, and the other one is a Muni. So you're obviously, you're buying less electricity from them. Correct. You're using the existing uh, grid to some extent and then, because um, you're now connected to it, and then you're generating some of your own electricity. Correct. So is there resistance on the part of the power, you know, the general area power provider to microgrids? Uh, excellent question. <laughs> and that depends upon uh, what utility that you're in. Uh, uh, depending upon the project, we always make an effort to reach out to the electric uh, utility here in New England. You got some very progressive utilities that are willing to work with you. Other parts of the country, it's not always that way. Uh, they can't stop a client, okay? So this is considered what we call behind the fence, right? So this is a, a behind the fence microgrid that's sitting on that client's own uh, property. And so the client has the opportunity to develop as much distributed generation but as- But stop you on the net metering. 
at, on the net metering and the interconnect process. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely correct. Yeah. So, so it always benefits you to be able to make sure that you're working directly with the, you know, whoever the LDC, the electric utility, and also the gas utility as well. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Was there any net metering value here? I mean, this is all behind the meter, right? So they're generating 24-7 power for themselves. And then what, what other power they need, they draw from, uh, from the power company. Again, uh, excellent question. Um, what I can, uh, the best way to, to answer your question today is that we develop microgrids for clients that really have a need for, remember those four boxes. There's, there, there's, there's one of those hot buttons. What, we, what we're trying to get the client to recognize though is that they have an asset. And so that asset is, st is still, it's, uh, you know, think of it as a stranded asset. It's, it's waiting there to protect the facility. That's, yeah, sure. that's what it's yeah. there for. Right, exactly. But during during normal operations, you've got the asset. You want to be able to maximize that. So I can speak for another hour about that, right? So so the 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 objective is is this is what we call moving the client, the the host client in this case, from being a uh, consumer to a prosumer, right? So think about the 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 uh, the strategies that they can start to develop uh, because they own a, a power producing asset. This total. Total anchor resource here uh, for the whole microgrid, I think, is uh, just under three megawatts. I mean, so they have the negotiating power to be able to potentially, you know, look to work with the utility to be able to use that asset during peak periods of time that the utility may require that asset, right? So maybe it's a nice blue sky, sunny day going out, but there's a peak period that either the the local utility or maybe the grid operator, uh, you know, would. A absolutely correct. So, so you can't look at so much all of today's net and metering costs. Part of their strategy, they also sell the power uh, during peak. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's part of their strategy, but they clearly see the, what the opportunity is. And, and in certain parts of the country, particularly on the West Coast right now, where time of use rates are becoming uh, not only a thing of the past, but becoming a negotiating point for the client, you can start to see if you have the capabilities to drive microgrid for resiliency needs you're sitting there with this asset that could be much more beneficial financially for the client going forward. And we can model those. Why clients. didn't you include uh, storage so that they could uh, produce their own peak power? Phase two. <laughs> Is storage there? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see any storage. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah that, that's, uh, that's, that, that's phase one. So, so most of our clients, uh, you know, storage works again economically, uh, primarily on the West Coast right now and also certain parts of the East Coast. We have a very attractive storage program right here in Massachusetts. It's kind of deep power for us, it's a great one. Well, it is, but it's maybe not always that cost-effective techno uh, technologically yeah. to be able to get it to pencil. So you have to look at, you know, again, the actual you know, uh, uh, power profile needs of that client and build it into the, the actual uh, microgrid and energy strategy plan going forward. But, but excellent point. That is. That is really, you know, the future of where we are in the market today. You know, if you think of uh, the utility industry has always been a one-way power flow, right? Those electrons were generated at some point and delivered to another point. This client has the ability to still be able to potentially, you know, utilize that power uh, purchase, but also has the ability now to, through the distributed generation system, to make that power flow the other way. So now they're, they become a prosumer Okay, because they have the ability now to charge that asset back into the market again. And if they have the wherewithal, they'll do it. Absolutely. And that's why you see as an energy as a service model, that's why you see a lot of the uh, new players in the market, Duke Energy, uh, Exelon, uh, you know, uh, Nextera, uh, and as well as many other companies that are looking to make these investments in these uh, types of microgrids, you know, uh, because they fulfill a need today, and there's also an opportunity going forward as, as the market evolves a little bit further. These are um, nice sort of defined facilities, so I get that. Have you, uh, have you been involved in any of these that play out, say, at a neighborhood scale? Uh, like Boston? Yeah, so, so when you say neighborhood, yes, we, 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 have, we, have, uh, we have actually quite a few uh, municipal microgrids. We, we have the first two microgrids in Connecticut under the deep uh, program, Th those are in the ground, one's at Fairfield, uh, one is about ready to be signed now at uh, Milford, so, uh, uh, but. Uh, now, those do all Milford, or 
how does that work? No, only only uh, only today, only specific needs. So the microgrid is building the infrastructure for distributed generation for those specific need right. facilities. And you've got multiple different stakeholders. In this case, you've got, believe it or not, you have a gas station you and you have a healthcare facility, right? Because part of the, the community's resiliency plan was to make sure they had you know, energy and, and healthcare. Right. Uh, now, again, that's dependent upon whatever the municipality needs are and what their desires are. So, absolutely, community-based microgrids, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them, uh, you know, uh, neighborhood microgrids, but community-based microgrids where there's a, a definition of, of, of a community coming together and developing those overall goals. Now, they just um, tax, raising the, you know, raising the uh, paying for it through taxes, or how are they? Yeah, ver uh, various fundings, uh, federal, local, uh, cost reduction, just like what we're talking about, uh, uh, and also you know being able to park and anchor that resiliency generation need at, at, at you know at that community. So again, these aren't just you know assets that are uh, that are meant to be stranded that'll sit there and wait for st another storm, Sandy. I mean, they're there to be able to create you know some type of economic value as well as achieve you know their sustainability goals going forward. So absolutely, that's a big part of our business. Thank you.